Radio Hour on Radio Sputnik. I'm your host, Garland Nixon. New information has come out about the JFK assassination, and Antony Blinken is threatening Sudanese who go against the U.S. policy in their nation. Additionally, we will talk about the possibility of a third world war and the likely outcome. Joining us to discuss these important matters, we have Dr. Gerald Horn. He's a professor of history at the University of Houston in Texas. He's an author, a historian, and a researcher. Dr. Gerald Horn, welcome back to The Critical Hour. Thank you for inviting me. A frightening yet sobering article in the New York Times by the one Stephen Wertheim um, says, can America really envision World War III? Your your thoughts, Dr. Horn? (laughs) Well, this is too ghastly and ghoulish to contemplate, (laughs) although I recommend uh, a skimming of that article at least. I think part of the problem with contemplating so-called World War III is the inadequate analysis of World War II. Uh, That is to say that it's apparent that with regard to the defeat of Germany, that that was won on the Eastern Front. That is to say it was won because of the selfless sacrifice of the then Soviet Union, which was a major victim of that conflict, uh, losing about 27 million people conservatively. However, if you look at Hollywood cinema, for example, Saving Private Ryan by the fabled director Steven Spielberg, uh, you would think that World War II was won by the United States of America. And I think that the second point is, with regard to World War II, is that a good deal of that conflict was not necessarily fought on U.S. soil which gives the U.S. people and the U.S. ruling elite a rather naive attitude towards what a global conflict involves. Now, of course, we all know about the bombing of Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, by Japanese forces in the then U.S. colony of Hawaii. Uh, But after that, U.S. territory generally was not affected. Uh, at least certainly not to the degree that Soviet territory was affected. And what happens is that the United States not only has these two gigantic moats protecting its soil, speaking of the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, but then it has a simpatico neighbor on the north, speaking of Canada, and a neighbor that it has looted and plundered over the decades on the south, speaking of Mexico, And I'm afraid to say that that looting and plundering continues to this very day. And because of these circumstances, the United States tends to have a rather simplistic view of what a titanic conflict involves, which, of course, brings us to the apparent uh, revelation that the United States has been assisting Ukraine in terms of these attacks on Russian air bases, including the all-important Ingalls Air Base, which we are told houses part of the Russian strategic triad, speaking of uh, nuclear bombers. And if those stories pan out, it shows a rather cavalier disregard for downstream consequences. That is to say, if the United States, in fact, used its satellite assets to assist its Ukrainian allies in launching military attacks on Russian soil, and in fact, an important Russian air base, uh, this underscores the point in the article that brought us to this conversation. Uh, That is to say, the rather naive attitude in this country towards a potential global conflict emerging in the 21st century. You know, Dr. Horn, the dynamics are so much different now. The Axis powers were different. You have um, uh, 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 Africa, South America, Asia, the Middle East, very much engaged now. And they're engaged in what I would call, uh, you know, we're separating this, but I would call this a centuries-old struggle against colonialism. In talking to people from Africa, the Middle East, that we we, you know, we we, we um, interview here. I find that they look at what's going on between Russia and the traditional colonial powers, including the U.S. empire, and they see that 
as part of this struggle, and they are taking a position on be, uh, in opposition to colonialism, in opposition to uh, uh, empire ruling the world. Well, as the lawyers might say, we can stipulate that your point is accurate, but does not obscure the wider point, uh, A, which is that the U.S. ruling elite oftentimes ignores or buries uh, what the attitude of people in the global South uh, tend to take because it's, in, it's convenient to do so. And in any case, uh, even if the people in the global South and their leaders are much more engaged with regard to a possible global conflict, the fact remains that that does not necessarily preclude the possibility mm -hmm. of the United States uh, stumbling into a global, a global conflict. For example, if you look at World War I, in many ways, uh, this was not necessarily a planned venture by either side. The major powers, speaking of London on the one hand and Berlin on the other, in a sense stumbled in to this conflict. They're, they were sleepwalking, to cite the verb of a former study uh, of that conflict. And you see a similar dynamic at play today. That is to say that I don't think that the U.S. ruling elite would like to suffer the damage that World War III would bring. On the other hand, their policies, uh, you could either call it sleepwalking or you could call it uh, unintentional catastrophe, is seemingly leading to that uh, fiasco-like result. Something else I think is important and relative because uh, there was a president that pushed back against the CIA and uh, we've got some new information. JFK assassination expert says CIA has proved Lee Harvey Oswald was involved in secret operation in 1963. Apparently there's, um, there is an argument the CIA is withholding evidence connecting them directly to Lee Harvey Oswald um, I, and, and I think, you know, I, I look at this kind of like a lot of the stuff that came from WikiLeaks. We knew it was true, but then we just got confirmation when it, WikiLeaks said, there you go, there's the documents. And I feel the same way about the JFK assassination. Your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Well, the story that you reference, uh, I think, needs to be taken seriously, not least because at the center of the story is the highly respected Washington journalist, uh, Jefferson Morley, uh, who over the years has turned out the one blockbuster story and or book after another. I should also say that if it is true that the CIA is withholding documents, which should not come as a shock, uh, in a sense, this is contrary to legislation and executive action of the last few years, the so-called JFK assassination bill, which calls for the disgorging of many of these uh, otherwise hidden documents. And we should ask the leaders of U.S. intelligence whether or not they're in accord uh, with this uh, action out of Washington. And finally, I would point your listeners to a recent massive biography of J. Edgar Hoover, the bulldog-like, pugnacious uh, director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation for decades leading up to his death in the early 1970s, uh, there is uh, added detail about uh, how the FBI was concerned about how it might be blamed, if you like, or somehow inculpated, uh, facing culpability, I should say, for the assassination of the U.S. president, speaking of Mr. Kennedy, and took some rather untoward actions uh, in that regard. And I would also add the footnote that what this points up is the instability of the United States of America, the instability uh, in the sense that uh, you have these repeated assassinations supposedly carried out almost in cliche-like fashion by a so-called lone crazed gunman, which obviously obscures any lives, the major forces that tend to benefit from regime change in Washington, from decapitation of the political leadership, uh, be it uh, at the White House or be it in terms of social movements, for example, the assassination of Martin Luther King, which the former and late Congressional Black Caucus leader, Louis Stokes, investigated and pointed uh, to the 
fact that uh, Dr. King and likely JFK as well were both killed as a result of elongated conspiracies. So I would hope that the mainstream media would keep a close eye on this story that we're referencing and perhaps uh, as Jefferson Morley, the journalist in question, to pen an op-ed uh, laying out the, his side of the story. Uh, to uh, cross the uh, seas to uh, Africa, Secretary of State Antony Blinken warned Sudanese leaders Wednesday that the United States will impose a travel ban on any individual who threatened to derail Sudan, Sudan's fragile, and I use this with great trepidation, democratic transition. <laughs> Your thoughts, Dr. Horn? Well, on the one hand, we welcome the fact that the civilian leadership and the military leadership have come to the table in Khartoum and trying to uh, broker an agreement uh, that would hopefully put that large uh, African nation uh, back on track. Uh, but I'm sure many of your listeners are wondering uh, who gave Secretary of State Anthony Blinken the right or the obligation to interfere in this very thorny matter, uh, certainly unilaterally, and certainly uh, one would hope uh, that if the United States deems it necessary to stick its nose into this affair, that it would do so in concert with the United Nations, particularly the United Nations Security Council, but alas, uh, there is no evidence that that is taking place. Uh, we've been talking with Dr. Gerald Horn. He's a professor of history at the University of Houston in Texas. He's an author, a historian, and a researcher. You're listening to.